Thank you everyone once again for joining us today on the cloudnative.fm podcast. And if you are being into the world of DevOps and CI CD systems and you want to use Kubernetes native way of CI CD system of the being the self-failing, the roll up, zero downtime deployments, these kind of stuff that you want to need with the Kubernetes as part of the CI CD pipeline. Once again, my guest who's been a founder of that project and doing so many amount of works on these open source project, Dan Lawrence. So thank you very much for joining me and tell us about the history of Tecton, how it's came to be and what you are doing in this project when it initially came up. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for inviting me to talk about Tecton, uh, the Tecton project. Um, yeah, so the Tecton project is a Kubernetes native, cloud native uh, CI CD platform. Um, so it provides a bunch of CRDs or custom resource definitions uh, that extend Kubernetes ways to let you define and create uh, new types of objects. Um, and these are objects that are well suited for building uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines. Uh, one of the main differences um, between the Tecton objects and kind of the native Kubernetes ones um, is that the Tecton ones are kind of designed to run things in order. Um, in a well-defined order. Kubernetes is really great at like spinning up a thousand pods at the same time and keeping them all running, but it doesn't have a lot of really good primitives for saying, run this pod to completion and then run these two in parallel and wait for them to finish and then run this third one and run that fourth one and maybe retry this one right here in the middle up to three times, um, that kind of thing. So that's really, really hard to do with the Kubernetes, um, the default Kubernetes types because they're more suited for application serving rather than pipeline orchestration. So that's where Tecton comes in. Um, it defines a bunch of types that are still Kubernetes style and Kubernetes native, but let you do things like say, run this before that, run this after, and it kind of resolves that graph and figures out how to get it all running inside of your Kubernetes environment. Yes, absolutely. And on, on top of that CI series, we're talking about these are the steps because you want the container images to be pulled down and then we do something else. And let's say you are doing the some inject some policies with web mutations or for the injecting some policies. This is, might be the next step. And the third step is might be you configure some storage on the Kubernetes cluster. So these are the different steps you need to do in order to your app work efficiently in the production environment. But on the topic of the, the Kubernetes native way of, what do you think, is it important to be a CI CD system? Is, is it look like to be a Kubernetes? But if it doesn't, what sort of disadvantages that CI CD system have? But if that system is already Kubernetes, you understand the language and the, let's say the APIs of the Kubernetes, what sort of advantages do we get? Yeah, I think the biggest one from a CI CD point of view is kind of just running all of your workloads the same way, which has a bunch of benefits for simplifying your operations and uh, security. Um, like one of the big things we've seen is people transition uh, from whatever they had before Kubernetes to Kubernetes is that they kind of do their deployment platform last in a lot of cases. So that usually means they have a Jenkins server running somewhere in a closet on a bunch of spare machines that people uh, forgot about and stopped using, um, with running a bunch of bash scripts. And that's what they use to deploy to whatever environment they used to deploy to. And they just set that up with some plugins and point that right up to Kubernetes now which works, uh, but then it means that you're not kind of, you're not completely migrated and any of these awesome cloud native features you use like syscall monitoring with Falco or auto scaling or billing setups um, don't work for your build platform. Um, you can't take advantage of the scalability of and reliability of Kubernetes. Uh, so by moving the uh, control plane for your build system to Kubernetes as well, you automatically get out of the box all of the stuff that you've built and the whole amazing Kubernetes uh, ecosystem has built for Kubernetes. You can sandbox your builds, you can uh, detect weird syscalls happening inside of them with eBPF, you can put them behind a network service mesh, you can you know, control exactly where they're allowed to talk to. Um, and it, it simplifies everything by giving you one kind of pane of glass to monitor everything in. Yes, absolutely. So tell us about the story because when initially Kubernetes came up, there is not a solution that is built into the Kubernetes. I, I see none of them were Kubernetes native, but if, if essentially in 2021, we see there are so many tools right now. One of them, I think, Argo, Argo workflow that are also, also Kubernetes native. So tell us about the history of the project, how it came into being, 
uh, how how long it's been in the in the Kubernetes ecosystem, and what sort of the people behind that awesome project? Sure. Yeah, at the start of Tech Thought, um, yeah, there there weren't too many other things doing this kind of stateful workflow orchestration that like you said. Um, Argo was uh, Argo workflows were probably the the closest thing at the time. Um, and Argo workflows are awesome. They're designed to be really flexible. You can do stuff like have loops and recursion and dynamic uh, pipelines that add other stuff to the end of the pipeline and stuff. So they're really flexible and good for kind of big complex like ETL style workloads where you're transferring data around and you need to kind of program the pipeline itself. Um, it turns out that that's actually not a great feature for building and deployment systems, though, where you don't want you know your pipelines to be self mutating and changing and um, having crazy branching and loops and recursion, uh, because you really want to understand and be able to predict what's going to happen with a build as it's going. Um, you might it ends up being a little bit more verbose sometimes because you have to write more. You can't have some of the cool, powerful language features, uh, but it's better from a security perspective, I think, because you can actually just look at it and understand exactly what will happen. You can't have one step go and add a bunch of other secret hidden steps later, uh, which makes your supply chain a lot easier to understand. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because I see that there are two thinking as the Kubernetes projects are moving around. The one is think you have so many things inside that's awesome too. So people can have a wonderful flexibility. So can do this thing in a different way, do this thing in a different way. But end up is doing it, you are doing so many complex things in it. And you need to realize the end, uh, learning curve behind the, that's understanding the project. And one is kind of a simple project like this tool is best in doing this kind of stuff. And if you are in that part of the world that you have a problem in your hand, this is a suitable tool for you, but they end up you having a less learning curve. Plus, you have a wonderful sort. You can predict that this solution can do. If you in, give that in, input, let's say, a, it input this and this output is absolutely predictable. So this is number one advantage of being uh, dropping out the extra feature in the tools. Yeah. And as I said, the next question came out of my my mind. So I I I I will work. I started exploring today of what Tecton is, and I ended under ending up learning about there are some pipelines in the Tecton. So can you talk us through how to build pipeline in the Tecton? What sort of languages you are using? Is it Kubernetes native, or how the, how do do you define pipelines in Tecton? Sure. Yeah. So Tecton has a couple of kind of top level types you have to start uh, understanding to work with it. Um, starting from the bottom, um, everything is kind of packaged up as a container because it's you know cloud native and Kubernetes and has to run on um, these clusters. Um, and containers actually make great environments for builds because you know the whole thing is predictable. You can pin the container by a digest and you get the exact same version of all of the tools every single time. So it's really good. You don't have to worry about stuff silently updating and breaking your build. Um, so each one of these containers. Uh, you know, if you put containers in a pod, you can have multiple containers, but they all run at the same time. Um, inside of a Tecton task, which is kind of the lowest level CRD, you can have multiple containers, but they run in order instead of um, in parallel. That's the big difference, and there's a whole bunch of crazy tricks to make that work inside of Kubernetes. Uh, but you can have you know five containers in one task, and they run in order as steps. So the first one might fetch some source code. The second, uh, you know, from GitHub. This, Second one might do a build on that source code, and the third one might do some kind of upload. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to kind of define the same thing. But you have multiple steps that all run on the same file system in the same pod with the same network with the same service account in order. Um, and you kind of wrap that up into a Tecton task CRD. Right? That's a YAML object, just like everything else in Kubernetes. Uh, the task is like a, you can think of it as a function definition, where the steps inside are the things that happen um, when the function is executing. Um, the task also declares some inputs and outputs, just like a function too, if we use that analogy. So there's input parameters, those can be kind of strings to explain like what URL you want to fetch um, and what to return, which is kind of like maybe the git commit that got pulled down from the latest branch. So it's like a function with input parameters and a return value and then a definition inside of it. So they can be reused and you can find a bunch of task definitions in the Tecton catalog uh, that people have written and contributed from the community. Um, tasks are designed to just do one thing, though. Um, you know, you're supposed to do one simple thing, so you can compose them into a bigger pipeline, um, and that's where the pipeline uh, CRD comes in. So the two main CRDs are task and pipeline. 
Um, a pipeline is a way to stitch together multiple tasks. And so you can uh, put them in order. You can have some basic branching and if statements. So if something fails, you, know, you can update a Slack channel or send an email. Um, so there's some basic conditionals, um, no looping, uh, nothing like that in the pipeline, but you can kind of feed uh, outputs from one task in as inputs to the next task and stitch it all together into a big graph. Um, so the pipeline can start from some kind of event and then process and execute different pods in your cluster along the way until it finishes with either success or failure. Um, so the pipelines themselves can also be reused. Um, so there's the uh, pipeline is also defined to have um, you know input parameters that then it passes in through the tasks and outputs. Um, so there's also a big selection of pipelines in the Tecton catalog. Um, so you can grab a bunch of ready-made ones uh, that you know grab source code, do a Java build, upload main artifacts, that kind of thing. You should be able to find most of these together in the catalog. Uh, these CRDs though don't actually do anything, right? You install them in your cluster and then they're just there. It's like you imported a function but you didn't call it. If that makes sense, uh, going back to the programming analogy. Uh, so you have the function definition there, you actually have to call it with some parameters. And so those are some different CRDs actually. Um, so those are task run and pipeline run. So you create one of those uh, in order to actually instantiate um, or execute the function or call it basically. Um, and you can do that a whole bunch of times. So if you have one pipeline, you can you know, create a hundred different runs of it you know, from different git commits or from different uh, repositories, that kind of thing. Uh, same for tasks. Um, so you create the pipelines and tasks in your cluster and then you execute them with pipeline runs and task runs. Yes, absolutely. So I can understand because with the task as a simple workflow, let's say you can, the first task might be to grab the images from the Docker Hub, but you need to realize that these images are signed by the, some trusty resources. So this might be the first task and might be the second task is do initialize some databases before the pod come up because pod consuming the some database with some data from the database. So these are the two simple stuffs. But on the pipeline end, you, we need to uh, understand how these run. So there might be the first pipeline, you have the multiple tasks, and these tasks will be combined in a pipeline. So they run sequentially. First, it came up pulling the Docker images from the Docker Hub. Then it understand it is already signed when initializing the database. So that's where the whole pipeline is built up because at the end of the day, some hosts or might be some tasks are failing and you know, you have to notify your team that these tasks are failing. So that's a part of the pipeline. That's a wonderful thing. But another question, as I see, there are so many things like you, I go to the Azure dashboard, let's say, I see there are some kind of task and the workflow there. If I go to the AWS, there are some, well, I think AWS, some kind of code build they have, they, they are providing. Then we go to the GitHub action side. The GitHub action is kind of similar. So how the tech done is actually, it, it used to be the Kubernetes native. That's a wonderful way. We don't need to learn other language. It is, it's already written in a YAML file and CRD. But how it's compared to the as ecosystem of the CI CD tools available, like Azure DevOps or the AWS Code Build or some GitHub Action, how it's similar or how it's different from these CI CD systems? Yeah, um, great question. So I think that you know the big difference is that Tecton is you know completely open source, and you kind of need to run it yourself, basically, which is good for some reasons. It's you know it's a trade off. Um, there's like the Azure DevOps stuff. There's GitHub Actions, which are hosted, and you get to just run all of your builds on those environments, which is awesome and convenient. But if you need the control, if you need to run on prem, if you want um, kind of a vendor neutral um, syntax and all this stuff for running your workloads, whatever cloud provider the Their own, um, then that's where Tecton comes in. Um, all of the other ones use YAML of some reason values are set up. So it is YAML, but it's not like a Kubernetes style API um, on top of that. So those are kind of the two main things. So since Tecton is Kubernetes style, it works with stuff like Helm and Customize and all of the other things that you can use to manipulate Kubernetes YAMLs. But it does usually mean there's a lot more YAML uh, because Kubernetes is very verbose, like everyone knows. Yes, absolutely. And another, another question, because I see the people are talking about the CI CD system might be what we understand that the CI CD system and task and pipeline and these task and pipeline 
might be run in some way. Let's say they need some virtual machine and they have some version. Let's say somebody have a task that might work on the Node.js 4.5, but it doesn't work outside the 4.5 Node.js. But in the Kubernetes native way, if, the Kubernetes, if we're using the Kubernetes feature, let's say these machines who are or who are hosting the, uh, the task and the pipeline might be they are crashing somewhere. But in the Kubernetes native way, these are built up on, or as Kubernetes are intelligent, they see the desire and the actual state model. If they see some of the tasks are failing because tasks are not written in a bad way, but the machine they are running on, they are actually failing. So the Kubernetes spun up another machine and these tasks are run locally there. So I think in moving forward, I see a lot of the CI CD tooling might realize the Kubernetes feature because as, as infrastructure as code, we see the tools are building up to understand how to build the infrastructure as code on Kubernetes plus use the Kubernetes feature on top of it. So we cover right now about task and the pipeline. And the next we think is coming up in my mind that's called events. Let's say I push the repository, I push the code in the GitHub repository. Now I want to do something else when I push the code in the GitHub repository. How Tecton might, might help me with that? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, once you've got all of this stuff defined declaratively using the Kubernetes style stuff, um, you still have to actually instantiate it, right? You could do kube control create um, to create a task run every time manually, uh, but that's a pain. So the next step is figuring out how to automate it when stuff changes, because that's typically what you want to do. You want to run CI builds with update status, or you want to do a release build when you tag something. Um, so that's where the third part of Tecton uh, comes in, um, which is Tecton triggers. Um, that's a way to kind of bind events um, and then some of the data from those events into a pipeline run or task run. And so you define kind of somewhat templated out uh, task runs and pipeline runs, um, which says, uh, you know, when an event comes in from GitHub matching this pattern, create a task run, um, create this task run and stick, you know, this key from the event payload into this field in the task run. Um, so if your task run expects a Git branch name, then, you know, you look at the GitHub API docs, see, you know, what the JSON payload looks like coming out of GitHub when something happens, and you can kind of pull that out and stick that into the task run. Um, so that's how you set stuff up um, to be automated and hook up to the external event systems. Um, GitHub, GitLab, all the source code providers all have pretty similar event systems where you give them an IP address or an endpoint, and there's a basic way to verify the security of that so you know it's coming from the right system. Um, and then you can hook that up to the pipelines and tasks that you've installed with the Tecton trigger system. Yes, absolutely. I think these, uh, another question on top of the triggers, I, uh, as we see, there are some other tools like, like somebody using the serverless functionality in Kubernetes and somebody using some kind of Prometheus, Grafana, and they see if these are stats or matrix, metrics are scaling up, they want to use another auto scaling system. Let's say they are using Keda for the K native, and the, if, they, if they collect metrics from this kind of stuff and they've used they are already using Knative, but now they are using to Keda because of these are scaling matrix are fit for the auto scaling in Keda. So these triggers are already uh, available or community works on that, or if these are not available, how people are doing to con contribute to these triggers? Um, yeah, so that's uh, a lot of that just kind of works out of the box. And that's one of the big side effects, the nice side effects of running um, all of your workloads in Kubernetes, right? So if you've got Prometheus hooked up to scrape metrics from everything, then Tecton exports those metrics. And so it just works for you. And you don't have to worry about a separate monitoring and observability solution for your CI CD platform. Um, the auto scaling one uh, for builds is awesome too. Since builds don't really run forever, right? It's not like a, a web server that would scale from 10 to 100 when load comes in. Um, you, you normally take more advantage of uh, like cluster level auto scaling rather than pod or uh, vertical or horizontal stuff at the pod level. Um, so what's really nice is you can have like a small cluster. Um, I usually use uh, Google Kubernetes Engine, GKE for my stuff. Um, but you can set up a small cluster that goes down to like one node when there's no workload. And then if you want to do a huge you know, build job, you can create a thousand different builds for a thousand different projects and your cluster will just scale up as you try to schedule all of those pods. And then it scales back down as you finish. Um, so it lets you take advantage of all of the nice uh, auto scaling and horizontal scalability that people build for the rest of their Kubernetes things for uh, 
a CI CD system. I do this a lot when I'm playing around with like reproducible builds or something like that when I'm working on little projects and I want to rebuild every Debian package from source at the same time. You know, I can just kind of write something and write a little loop and create a thousand different build jobs for every Debian package and then my cluster just goes up and then it comes back down. Yes, absolutely. And that's, I think that's the biggest advantage of using Kubernetes because Kubernetes landscape is so huge. When, you, when I first look back up the CNCF landscape, so it's my spinning my head around how oh, many things are there. But I'm end up happy because there are all community are working on these kind of tools. Because at the end of the day, we need some kind of extra tooling to be work efficiently. We we'll start doing projects manually, then we want to automate these kind of things, but I can't do it. I want this to somebody else do it, these kind of things. I want to use these kind of things. But end up, I see the Kubernetes community is wonderful because people are using these kind of tools that you generally don't work with. But when you, when you woke up next day, you see the tool that is currently, that you are previously asking about yourself. You build that tool, but it's currently available. So that's move. community is moving very fast and a very rapid space. So now there's a few rapid fire questions for you, Dan. So let's say if there's somebody companies are not using the Kubernetes native way of the CI CD, what they what they want to lose or what they want to catch or what they are how they should migrate to the Kubernetes native way of CI CD tooling. Yeah, I like to say that um, you know security is one of the biggest reasons to do this. Um, you want your build environment to be at least as secure as the environment you're deploying into, right? You don't want it to be less secure because then that's like leaving the door wide open on a you know really fancy electric fence or something like that, right? You want the the door to be at least as secure as the rest of it. You want your build system to be at least as secure as your production environment. So if you're doing some kind of you know you're still doing a Kubernetes migration or you're about to start one, then I like to suggest that the first thing you migrate actually is your CI/CD system. Um, so it's, you, the first thing you do is stop deploying from, you know, it's whatever server and bash scripts you have sitting on a machine under somebody's desk and move that up to the cloud and move that into Kubernetes first. Um, so then you have that system, you know, properly operating, secured, scalable, um, and that deploys to both Kubernetes for you for your new things and your old environments for your old setups. Um, and then as you migrate stuff more and more, um, you sh you're starting from that base uh, secure build system, so you don't have to worry much after that. You're going to have to make the switch at some point. You don't want to keep your build system around forever, not on Kubernetes. So I like to tell people to start there first. Yes, absolutely. And now the, another good question is for you that is, where the Tecton CD community, how do we find that? How to contribute to this awesome project? And where to find people who are talking about Tecton CD? Yeah, uh, the community is huge and it's active and it's great. It's one of the, the coolest parts of starting a project like this is getting to watch the community take off. Um, so on GitHub, uh, we're at github.com slash tectoncd, uh, T-E-K-T-O-N-C-D. Um, and there's a community repo under there with a bunch of links to Slack and meetings and working groups and email lists and all of that stuff. The Slack is really active. It's got hundreds of people in there um, discussing how they're rolling it out as well as kind of the development team talking about what's going on and new features and everything. So uh, those are the best ways. And uh, I'll be, there's a bunch of talks at all the KubeCons this year about um, Tecton. So uh, you can find those recorded or at the live events too. Yes, absolutely. And you will find the link here in the YouTube description, what the Dan is talking about. And another question, what Tecton is lacking at this point in time? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think the biggest thing um, at this point is getting the API to be GA and stable. Um, the API has been going under a bunch of revisions as people start building things on top of it. So the APIs right now are beta for all of the types for pipeline, task run, and triggers, uh, which just means uh, breaking changes can happen with some warning. Um, so uh, the team is firming up those APIs right now. getting those two yes and another 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 question is that what is your most excited about tecton what is the best feature you like about tecton and uh, what what was most exciting part of tecton cd 
Yeah, so one of the areas I'm most excited about lately is the Tecton Chains project, um, which is a Tecton CD slash chains. Um, I've been doing supply chain security for a couple of years now. I mean, we designed Tecton early on to have a bunch of really good security features out of the box, like you know, just declarative pipelines and predictable ones like we talked about before with no dynamic looping and, and stuff like that. Um, and so the Tecton Chains project is a way to build in a whole bunch of awesome supply chain security features like SBOMs for software bill of materials and signed containers and cryptographically verifiable um, you know, supply chains from source code all the way to the built artifact. Uh, because Tecton has all of that metadata, it's a little bit verbose in all of the YAML, but because we have all of that, you can just install the Tecton Chains uh, plugin and just get all of these automatic signed um, audit trails for free. Um, so that's one of the things we're working on now and using all the different formats uh, like in Toto and the update framework and SigStore um, and the SPDX uh, software bill of materials format and just hooking that all up out of the box. So once you get everything on Tecton, you can just install this with one command and start securing your supply chain. Yes, absolutely. And we talked about this with Dan previous episode and the link in the description and go and check that out because supply chain security is vital as with security is we can't compromise in any way. So another question, do you go to KubeCon LA? Yes, I will be there. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And do you have talks there? Uh, yeah, I am uh, helping out with the supply chain security uh, day zero event. So that is on the first day. Uh, and then I have a talk about SigStore uh, at some point. I don't remember which day it is. So. Yes, and I, I see the KubeCon has some uh, uh, pro, some K KubeCon zero day events, and I think the security supply chain security con is also is, is on the KubeCon is I think prior to the KubeCon itself. So can you talk right. about what is going what's going to happen there in that conference? Yeah, so we have a whole day focused on supply chain security, and we have a bunch of talks about Tecton um, and Jenkins and in Toto and SigStore and all the different projects in the CNCF and the Continuous Delivery Foundation uh, working to make supply chain security easier. We also have some panels and some end users talking about how they're rolling these things out today to start securing their supply chains. Yes, absolutely. So we'll talk about so many technology expect of things. <laughs> Now let's move to you, to your personal question. So how you, how you spend your time, let's say, all day talking about supply chain as you have some else activities as well, because COVID has reduced our activities. <laughs> Yeah, uh, from work, it's mostly supply chain security stuff spread out across uh, you know, a bunch of different projects um, like Tecton and SigStore, um, and also putting it into practice uh, directly. So that's like trying to use these things that we're building and dog food them uh, in the releases. So all the tools, uh, like we try to sign and verify all the Tecton releases now with SigStore, and we try to build all of the SigStore stuff with Tecton, and we try to uh, you know, kind of dog food all of this stuff, even for some of the other base initiatives that we produce, like uh, DistroList, which is used by most of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So trying to build new tools and then use them ourselves at the same time. Yes, absolutely. And I think wonderful article, uh, all these articles, I think you'll find it, the link in, in the description of the YouTube. So before I let you go, Dan, what's your next plan for this month? Because I see the hair is growing up and you need some time to sh shave those hair and look pretty, but I, think I like your hairstyle. So what's next for you? Like next, what you are doing for the next four months? How you spend your whole day? Like, can you talk to your family, friends? What, how you spend your time the whole day? Can you talk us to the talk, of, talk about that? Oh, for the next four months, I don't know. Um, you know, the, there's finally some conferences starting up again, which will be nice. Uh, hope that I hope to be able to travel to um, in September and in KubeCon in October, and who knows after that? That's too far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So every time I talk to the Jan, I really, really enjoy talking to him because he explained these kind of concept in a really precise and short way, and I really learn so many thoughts, so many good te te technologies from in the, by, by, feed, by learning his feed on the Twitter side, what he's talking about, what is most exciting about these kind of technology. And if you are into the supply chain with the security kind of things, I think Dan is a person for you. Go check that out, follow him on Twitter and he help you get up to speed with the security in your enterprises and community kind of stuff. 
So before I let you go, let you go, Dan, can you describe in a very few words what is supply chain security and what is Project Six Tone, what Tecton CD in a very few lines? Sure. Yeah. Supply chain security at the simplest is knowing what is running in production, um, everything from your code all the way down to all of your dependencies, um, and then uh, being able to monitor and make sure that it's secure and hasn't been tampered with. Um, and so that's why the projects like um, Tecton and other CI CD systems are critical because they're the ones that actually go and fetch all of that code and compile it and build it. So they're the biggest point um, of attack and the biggest point to actually start securing in order to understand your supply chain and secure it. So that's how all of this stuff fits together um, in my head and what I'm working towards. Yes, thank you very much, Jan. A pleasure talking to you. Hope to see you again and hope to see you again in Cloud Native Islamabad. And we can do a demo on Cosine or Tecton CD because people are like to interesting about talking about and learning about these kind of technology. But I do appreciate your time for being to connect it with me and help me understand this op op open source supply chain security and Tecton and Kubernetes native way of CICT. Thanks everyone who showed up for this podcast. Hope to catch you again in the next episode and the next guest is coming up. Thanks, bye-bye everyone, stay safe and stay happy.